So our reading for today comes from the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verses 11 through 18, and then chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Let us hear the words of the Lord. This is the message that you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue but with actions and in truth. And then in chapter 4, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might have life through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and we rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. And this way, love is made complete among us. So we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother and sister. This is the word of God that is spoken for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, in his book, The Kingdom of God is a Party, Tony Campola tells a story about a very unlikely encounter that he had with a prostitute one day. He had just arrived in Honolulu for vacation, and he was dealing with a little bit of jet lag, trying to adjust to the time zone, and he found himself wide awake in the middle of the night. About 3.30 in the morning, he was incredibly hungry. And so he decided to go out and try to find some place that was open in order to get something to eat. But the only place he could find was a small bar that was on the wrong side of town. And a few minutes later, he found himself surrounded by about eight or nine prostitutes who had just gotten off of work for the night. And as they came in, he heard one of them talking about how the next day was her birthday. And, and, and the other girls started to give her a little bit of a hard time. So, so what do you want us to do then? Do you want us to throw you a party? Do you want us to sing happy birthday, buy you a cake or something? 
And she said, why do you have to be so mean? I was just telling you, and besides, I, I've never had a party in my entire life. So why should this year be any different? And Tony says that those words hit his heart. And so he decided to do the radical, unexpected thing. He talked to the bartender, and the next day he decided he was going to throw this girl a surprise party. He put up some balloons and streamers around the bar. He bought a cake. And, and when they all got in there, they all sang happy birthday. And at that point, he offered to say a prayer for the girl. And when he had finished the prayer, the bartender said, Hey, you never told me that you were a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to anyway? And he said, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. I belong to a church that loves people, that loves people like God loves people, no matter who they are, no matter where they've been, no matter what their story has been to that point in life. That's the kind of church that I belong to, a church that radically loves people. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of church that I hope our church will be in this community, that we would love the people who no one else loves. That we would love the people who everyone else wants to hold at a distance. That we would love each other as God loves us. We are currently in a series that is called Disciple What? And throughout this series, we are looking at what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. A disciple who looks like Jesus, who acts like Jesus, who, who thinks like Jesus in the midst of daily life. And, and so we are looking at what this means. And two weeks ago, we began by exploring the faith of a disciple. The faith that is lived out in relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and then we looked at last week, we looked at this idea of the sacrifice of a disciple. The sacrifice. And we looked at, saw that Jesus wants us ultimately to become less, that he might become more and more in our lives. And today we are taking a look at the love of a disciple. The love of a disciple that loves like Jesus loves. You see, when Jesus decided to summarize what the entire Bible was about, he, he summarized it in just two things. He said that we are to love God and that we are to love people. That we are to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength with every aspect of who we are and that we are to love others as he loves them. That we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. That, that one word love really summarizes what the entire Bible is really about. And in many ways, it's the central theme. The term love actually appears 310 times in the Bible. It, it, it appears in reference to who God is. It appears in reference to what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And it also appears in reference to who we are called to be in this world. That we are to be the people who love as Jesus loves. Most of us probably know the most famous verse about love in the entire Bible, John 3.16, right? Some of us grew up memorizing that verse uh, that, that uh, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Most of us probably know the famous love chapter in the Bible because we've heard it at about every single wedding we've been at, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. Love never fails, right? We've heard those things. But, but of all of the books in the Bible that talk about love, 1 John is the one that addresses this subject more than any other. In fact, one commentator called it the most profound analysis of Christian love that we find in the entire New Testament. In fact, in our reading for today, the word love appears 33 times in just 23 verses. Right? That, that suggests that if we're going to talk about what it really looks like to love like Jesus loves, that this is a pretty good spot to start, right? That, 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 that we can glean some things. Because when John starts to talk about love, well, what he does in this book of 1 John is he kind of interweaves this discussion of love with a few other topics. That he talks about what we are to believe. He talks about how we are to live. And then he talks about how we're to love. 
Because for John, that to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is defined in these three ways. It's defined by, by believing the right stuff about Jesus. It's defined by doing and living according to the godly ways. But it's also defined by loving as Jesus loves. And if we miss any one of these things, then we have missed them all. And so he interweaves these stories back and forth in order to show us that love is a critical aspect a critical thing about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in this world. But the thing that I struggle with, and maybe you struggle with this too, is that the love is another one of those words that doesn't really mean what we think it means. When we hear that word, we automatically get some ideas in our mind, right? We picture, you know, feelings and emotions and and, and we start to think about romance and all those kinds of things that, that love in our world is something we fall into and out of based on whatever is happening to us at any given moment in time. I mean, you probably have heard people say, I, I just don't love him anymore. I, I just don't love her anymore. We, we, we've heard those kinds of things that, that, that in our world, love is this very self-centered thing. In fact, one pastor put it like this. He, he said, we love our children because they're extensions of us. We love our father and our mother because our life is related to theirs. We love our relatives because they're ours. We love our dog, our cat, our home. We love the friends who please us. We love those people who help us. Love is always directed to those who do something for us. As the love of God comes into the world, it becomes twisted, distorted, and directed only toward ourselves. And what we really love is the projection of ourselves in other people. But yet when I look at Jesus, you know, that's not the kind of love that I see. I, I don't see a self-centered love. I don't see a love that, that changes based on how the wind is blowing at any moment in time. Right? When we see Jesus, we see an unconditional love. A, a love that loves to the extreme. A love that loves even the people that, that we wouldn't expect to be loved. Right? Well, this is what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those people who persecute you. If you only love those people who love you, what reward will you get? Are, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you only greet your brothers or sisters, what are you doing more than others? Don't even the pagans who don't know God do that? You see, the love of Jesus Christ is a love that is unlimited. Right? It's not driven by feelings. It's not driven by events. It's not driven by circumstances. It's not driven by whatever is going on at this particular moment in time. The love of Jesus Christ transcends all that stuff. Right? It is always reaching out no matter who we are or where we've been or what our story has been like. That it loves the least lovable people in the world. The love of Jesus is for all people, even our enemies. Even those people who've offended us. Even those people who've hurt us. Even the people on the other side of the political aisle. The love of Jesus is a love that reaches out to all. And if we're to love like Jesus loves, then, then I think we have some things to learn. Right? If we're to, to live like Jesus and, and act like Jesus and think like Jesus, then, then we have some stuff to learn about what it really means to love the people in our life that are the hardest for us to love. And so I want us to take a look at just four things from this passage in 1 John that I want to highlight. And the first is this, it's, it's, it's the cost of love. That love at its very core is a costly thing. Right? He says this in 1 John 3.16, the other 3.16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Or, or it's the same thing in, the, in John 3.16. For the, God so loved the word that he gave. He gave his one and only son. In both of those passages, you see, love is defined by the example of death. Right? Jesus dies for us. He, he, he chooses to go to a cross. He chooses to, to be sacrificed for you and for me. I want you to think about that image because it's one that's so common 
and familiar to us. But I want you to think about it from God's perspective. Right? Put yourself in his shoes for a minute. And, and imagine that you had to send your one and only son or your one and only child to, to go to a cross to suffer and die. Can you imagine how hard that must have been? Can you imagine the pain, the heartache, the, the hurt? But yet God loved us that much that he was willing to send his son to die. He went to that kind of extreme. When we, when we think about the cross, the, the idea that is being proclaimed is that love is costly for God. It's costly, right? It, it cost him everything. It cost him the life of his son. It cost Jesus had to give up his entire life. It's costly to love as Jesus loves. And, and so here's the lesson that, that I think that comes out is that, that true love always involves some form of cost. It always involves some form of self-sacrifice. It always involves some sort of risk, right? Because anything that's costly is going to take something away from us, right? There's going to be some risk there. So if you think about this, there, there, there's risk when you put yourself in any relationship and you start to open up your heart, right? When you open up yourself to the other person because that other person might be able to take whatever you say or whatever you do and, and, and take that and twist it and use it for something else. That there is cost when we enter into any relationship with another person. Right? There is risk when we give to the hungry or when we give to the thirsty because we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Right? We, we don't know if, if some, some major tragedy is going to hit on our way home and it's going to cost us everything and we're going to need whatever it is that we gave to that person. Right? There, there is risk in tending the sick because it might mean that we are exposed and, and we end up catching whatever it is they have. There is risk when we welcome the refugee or the immigrant or the stranger in because it might compromise our own security and safety. But you see, as Christians, we can't fall into the trap of thinking that the end goal of the Christian life is our own safety, our own comfort, our own security, because Jesus gave his life. And if it costs Jesus that much, then it's going to cost us something to love like Jesus loves. Right? He calls us in many ways to embrace that same kind of self-sacrificial love when we are loving everybody around us. I'm reminded of a story that comes out of the Roman Empire. It was 165 AD, and Marcus Aurelius was the emperor at the time, and a major plague broke out in the nation. It spread throughout the Roman world. It lasted about 15 years, and about a quarter to a third of the entire population of the Roman world died. About a century later, another plague broke out as well, and once again, the Roman world began to panic, and, and they did all the same stuff that they had done a hundred years before, that the common response was one of two things. You either fled the country, right, to try to get away, or, or you did everything you could to lock yourself in, and if someone you knew caught that disease, you kicked them out of the house. Right? They were thrown onto the street to fend for themselves. But the one group of people that didn't act like everybody else was the Christians. Right? They didn't kick people out. Instead, they went out into the street and they brought people into their homes. And they welcomed them in and they fed them and they cared for them and they gave them drink. Right? They, they cared for the people because they had been taught to love like Jesus loves. It might have cost them their life. But they were willing to take the risk because Jesus had died for them. And the entire Roman world saw this. And because they loved to the extreme, Christianity became a faith that couldn't be contained in their country. It was all because they loved. I mean, we've all heard that hymn, the 
No, we are Christians by our love. By our love. And think about the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. I mean, we all know this story, right? And this guy is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he's attacked by a band of robbers. And he's left for dead on the side of the road. And then a priest comes by. And because he represents the church, you, we expect that he's going to do something. And a Levite comes by. And because he, again, represents the temple, we expect that he's going to do something. But, but neither one of them react. In fact, the one guy that no one would have expected to do anything about is the, the Samaritan comes along and he decides to take the risk. I mean, I just find this so interesting because as he comes in and he begins to tend to this guy, he's taking a lot of risk here, right? He's making himself really vulnerable, not just with this other person, but because this could be a trap here, right? They could have, you know, left him there waiting for some poor sap to come along. There's a lot of crevices and caves in this area, right? So they could have been hiding out, waiting for the one person who comes along to show some love and compassion to this guy and then jump out. And yet he takes the risk to show love. And he puts him on his donkey and he takes him to Jericho and he pays the innkeeper for his stay and he says, whatever it costs, whatever, no limits, no boundaries, because love is costly. To love like Jesus loves is costly. C.H. Dodd once said this, love is the willingness to surrender that which has value for our own life to enrich the life of another person. Let me say that again. It's to surrender that which has value for us for the sake of another person. And so I wonder, what's it really costing you to love the people in your life? Does it cost you anything? Uh, what, what, what risks are you taking? What, what is it that you're giving up? What, what sacrifices are you making to love as Jesus loves? Secondly, we see the motivation of love. And we see this in 1 John 4, 19, where it says we love because Christ first loved us. No, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say we love because they deserve it. It doesn't say we love because of what they've done. And we love simply because Jesus first loved us. I'm reminded of the story of Jacob de he, he was one of the members of Doolittle's crew. And he was charged with bombing Tokyo in World War II. And, and the mission didn't quite go to plan. He found himself captive by the Japanese. And he, at first, he was one of the most violent, ruthless prisoners that the Japanese had ever had. They were terrified of this guy because no matter what they did to him, he didn't fear them. He kept reacting in vicious, violent ways towards him. And so eventually, they just decided they were going to keep him in solitary confinement all the time. And, and somehow, he managed to get a Bible there in solitary confinement. And he didn't have anything else to do, and so he decided he would just start reading this thing. And, and, and as he read the pages of the Gospels, the love of Jesus just jumped off the page. And he realized the extreme that Jesus had went to to love him. And that one realization changed everything about his life. He stopped being a violent prisoner. Instead, he became the most peaceful man in the camp. And he began to love the people who were holding him hostage. He prayed for them. He helped them out. I and mean, he began to do everything he could to bless them. You see, when we realize how much that Jesus has done for us, it changes the way that we treat other people. That we begin to love as he loves, not because they deserve it, but because we were loved when we didn't deserve it. You see, as Christians, our first impulse should be to love. 
Right? Our second impulse should be to love. Our third impulse should be to love. Our last impulse should be to love. Every single impulse that we have as the people of God should be to love, no matter who that person is or what their story is like. We love simply because Jesus first loved us. You see, hatred and unforgiveness gossip and grudges, the desire to get even, none of these things have any place in the life of a disciple. When, when we build walls around our hearts and we hold people out at arm's length, we're not really loving them as Jesus loved them. When, when we're driven by fear, we're not really loving because perfect love drives out fear. When, when we're using somebody for what we can get, we're not really loving as Jesus loves. to love simply because he loved us. John Calvin once said, how can we love God when we're dismissing the image of God that's right in front of us? And I wonder what, what's driving the way that you're treating other people? Is it your fear? Is it an offense that maybe they get made 20 years ago? And you're still holding on to it? Is it the sacrifice of Jesus? Third, thirdly, we see the source of love. The source of love. We're, we're told that God is love. And that love stems from God. That the people who love come from God. And that those who do not love ultimately are not from God. You see, the basic argument that, that he's trying to make is this. That if, if the God of love is present in our life, then there is going to be something of his love in us. So, so think of it like this. I mean, we all resemble our parents in some way, right? right we, we look like our parents, and when we're young, we always say, I'm not going to act like my parents later in life. And, and then we get a little bit older, and we start to say something, and we think, man, I sound just like my mother. You've all done this, right? Right? It, it's just natural, right? That, that if, if we are from somebody... There is going to be something of that other person in us. It's, it's natural. If we are from God, then there is going to be something of the love of God that is flowing through us. It's not going to be something we have to think about. It's not going to be something we have to decide. It's just going to happen because it's who we are. Because we are His children. Because He is our Father. And so, effectively, he's trying to say that what we, are do, what we do shows what, who really is our father. Because we're going to be like our parents. And so I wonder, what, what are your actions, the way you love, actually saying about who you are? And then finally, the action of love. The action of love. And St. Francis of Assisi once said, preach the gospel every day, use words if necessary. You see, love isn't an emotion. Love isn't a feeling. Love is an action. It's an act of will. It's a choice. It's a decision that we make day in and day out. 1 John 3.17 puts it this way. If a person has material possessions and we see them in need and, that, and, and we don't care, how can the love of God remain in us? James says a very similar thing in James chapter 2. What good is it if people say they have faith, but they don't do anything to show it? Imagine there's a brother or sister who's naked, and they never have enough food to eat, and you say, go in peace, stay warm, keep well fed, but you don't do anything to actually provide for their needs. And then he goes on to say, faith without works is dead. Right? Because if we have something of the love of God flowing through us, we're going to begin to act in loving ways to the people around us. Because simply speaking in a loving manner isn't love. I mean, we all know people who, who have said things and then they turn around and they do something else, right? Right? Simply speaking in a loving manner isn't love. Love is always expressed in action. So if we see a need, we have an obligation to act. 
we see a need, we have an obligation to act. And so this is where I want to end today. It's really easy to talk about love in a sermon and to have you listen to it and talk about it, but where the rubber meets your road is what you do with it when you leave here. Right? It's the way you actually love people as you go about uh, this week. Uh, you see, C.S. Lewis said this. He said, it's easier to be enthusiastic about humanity with a capital H than it is to love individual people. Right? It's easy to talk about it in the abstract. It's easy to stand up here and to talk about love. But where it gets hard is when it's that person that, whose face comes to our mind. And so I want you to think about the particulars right now. I want you to think about those people in your life that it's hardest for you to love. Get their name, their face in your image, in your mind. And I want to challenge you this week, whoever that may be, whether it's your spouse, your ex, your kids, your neighbors, your coworker, someone who hurt you 50 years ago, somebody in the church, whoever it is, I want you to, to think about that person. And then I want to challenge you to call them Write them, text them, you know, however you do your communication, reach out to them in a loving way this week. Reach out to them in a loving way. Because here's, here's the secret. The more we act in a loving way towards somebody, the more we grow to love that person. Right? The, the more we act in a harmful way towards somebody, the more we grow to hate that person. Again, C.S. Lewis said this. He, he said, don't waste your time bothering about whether you do love your neighbor. Simply act as if you did. Because as soon as this, we find one of the life's greatest secrets that when you're behaving as if you love somebody, you will come to love them. And I, I remember several years ago, when I was in my very, very first church, and there was a gal there who, who came to me one day and she said, I'm really struggling right now. There's... My, my sister's boyfriend has done some stuff, and, and I just I can't love him. I can't forgive him. I can't seem to get past this. And, and so what I challenged her to do was just start praying for him every day. Not, not, not to fix him, not to solve the problem, but just to pray for God's blessing on his life. And, and so she went and did this, and she came back after a while, and she said, man, that was so hard to do, and at first, I, I didn't want to do it. It was like, you know, just pushing myself to, to say the words because I had no desire. But the more I prayed for him, the more I actually came to love him and to care about him. Because we can't stay angry at somebody when we're praying for God's blessing in their life. God does something in here and he changes us. And so I want to challenge you to do something to act in a loving way to the person that's hardest for you to love. And see what God does. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you. We come because we know that there are people in every one of our lives that they irritate us, they drive us up the wall, and everything in us says, I don't want to do this. But I pray that you would help us today. Help us to love as you love. That, that we would show who we really are. And that the world would see. That we simply love because you loved us. In your name we pray. Amen.